Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, uh, today we're back working on the Jimmy DiResta bandsaw restoration, and uh, particularly we're going to be working on starting the process of making the new shaft that we'll use on the bottom. Now, again, if you've been following along with the restoration project, you'll know that uh, we had to cut and bore the taper out of the bottom bandsaw wheel, and uh, we're going to have to remake that shaft. Now, Today's challenge is uh, dealing with the taper that's on this. Now, the, the part that fits up inside the hub of the bandsaw is a tapered shaft. Uh, it's got a nut on the end that kind of pulls it in there tight. But basically, when you pull that taper into that taper in the socket there, those two tapers match and they stick together really, really, really well. Kind of like a Morse taper does in the tailstock of your lathe. You know when you put that in there, it's good. Or the the taper on a Jacobs chuck that mounts to your drill press. All that is is a taper fit and uh, that will stick two parts together really really well. So uh, the challenge is is we got to make that new taper and make it match the other one but before we could do that we need to do some measurements and figure out what the taper is and we also need some type of reference uh, of that taper that we can use on our lathe to set the, uh, the, the taper attachment to be cutting the proper taper. So let's get in here. I've already done some measurements and some math and I've already done some figuring here. So let me kind of get you guys caught up and uh, we'll see where we're at. All right, so here's where we're at. There were two shafts on this. There's the upper shaft and the lower shaft. And uh, as you can see, the taper and the shaft on the upper shaft is a smaller diameter and length in the hub of the bandsaw wheel than the bottom taper. Now the bottom one of course is the driven shaft, so this is the one that's going to be powered. It's going to have a lot more torque and everything on it, so it makes sense that it is larger than the one on the top. Basically the one on the top, just the band wheel is just going to be going around it up there. It's just kind of, um, there's really not any, any stresses or anything on it. So they opted to go with a smaller diameter shaft and a smaller taper as well. This is the actual shaft that we pulled out of the top. This is the taper piece. The taper was kind of from here to here. And again, we had to bore this out. We had to cut the shaft off, bore it out, and uh, which is part of what's going on up here. But this is what was left of it. And that's kind of what I've been uh, working with to a certain extent. So here's what I've done. I came in here and I kind of took the, uh, the small shaft and the large shaft and I did some measurements on them and did some calculations and figured out what the taper was on both of these, these shafts. Now, my game plan was I was assuming, which is always a bad thing to do, but I was assuming that the taper would be the same on the top and bottom shaft. And obviously the sizes are different, but to make things even more complicated. The tapers, the actual tapers are different as well. So my original game plan was, is we were just gonna mount the shaft up over in the lathe and kind of use it as my template to set the taper attachment to. That's not gonna work because the tapers are different. So how did we measure and determine the tapers? Well, I did it uh, two different ways. I uh, measured the, uh, the diameter, the small diameter and the large diameter plus the distance between the two. And you can see on that shaft there, the large diameter measured 0.1, uh, or excuse me, 1.935. The small, di or small diameter was 1.850 and that was over 4.350 inches. Now, I wanted to get my taper down to thousandths per inch because I have a taper micrometer that measures in that. We'll show this in a minute. And uh, I wanted to be able to basically be measuring in the same, same thing. So it's just some simple math. You know, we took the difference of those two numbers. Basically it's uh, uh, 0 0.085 or yeah, 0 0.085 over 4.350. I just uh, divided that out, basically made this bottom number one, and it comes out to uh, 0 0.0195 over one, one inch. So 100 or 19 and a half thousandths over one inch. That was based on um, the actual uh, measurements here. Um, and then I also measured it with my 
taper micrometer, and again, I'll show this in a minute. And we came out with a slightly different number, uh, but within a couple of thousand. So uh, what was that, uh, 19, 20, two thousandths difference between the two. Uh, so uh, that one measured 21 and a half thousandths per inch. And I know that this particular micrometer is a little finicky, so uh, I'm basically looking at that you know, we just kind of went with it. Now, most tapers are really not in thousandths of an inch per inch, but they're in inches per foot. So I took this number, multiplied it times 12, because there's 12 inches in a foot, and we came out with almost exactly 0.250 inches per foot uh, based off of, um, you know, kind of the average of these two. So I feel pretty certain that on this top one, that the, the, the taper, the included taper, basically the combination of the taper on both sides is a quarter of an inch per foot. A lot of talk to get to the end point there. Now we did the same thing on this uh, large shaft down here. And instead of measuring this, which uh, obviously has been pressed out of the, the hub and possibly deformed a little bit. Uh, and really this top end, I wasn't able to get a good measurement. I actually measured the, the, the dimensions inside the hub, did the same thing and uh, calculated it out. And this one came out to point zero one six two inches uh, per inch. And I did check down here in the bottom of this using the uh, micrometer and got almost the exact same number. Um, and basically what I'm able to determine from this one is, is that this taper is 3 sixteenths of an inch per foot. So a quarter of an inch per foot, 3 sixteenths of an inch per foot. So a different taper on the two. And uh, this one here came out almost exactly, when I measured it, uh, almost exactly uh, 3 sixteenths inch per foot. So I'm, I'm, I'm nearly positive certain that that was the taper. So. Bottom line, guys, is I need to come up with a something to use as a reference on this. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually make a taper gauge. And let me show you an example of one. So this is a, a taper gauge that I actually made. I think I did a video on this a while back. This taper actually is one inch per foot taper. So I need to make a gauge like this. It is a three sixteenths of a foot taper. Actually, I need to make it half of that because uh, it's 3 sixteenths included. So if you basically were to mirror this over, so it needs to be 3 seconds of an inch per foot it needs to be my reference taper that we will use. And I will then turn around and use this gauge over on the lathe to use with a dial indicator and set my taper attachment to cut the right taper on uh, on the shaft up here. So today's project is uh, gonna be doing this. So I do wanna kinda show this taper um, micrometer because it is kind of a neat little thing that you can use to, and we can use this when we get through to double check our work and everything. Uh, and this really kinda helped me verify what's going on. So I'm gonna show you, we'll measure the, the, the small uh, shaft here using this taper micrometer real quick. So this taper micrometer is not for measuring a distance between two points. It's really measuring the difference between this point and this point up here. It's kind of like a, um, a sign bar in, in some ways. And what I want to do is this, this side over here is adjustable. I'm just going to kind of slide it in here. Uh, let see, I'm going to pull that end out a little bit and tighten that back up. And what we're going to do is we're going to slide this up on there until it's whatever distance that is, it's really irrelevant where it's touching. And then we'll come in here and use our little micrometer head to squeeze down and measure. the difference between what zero would have been uh, here and what this is. So what this is, is this is one inch between these two pins and uh, exactly one inch. And we got a micrometer head in there here that's measuring how far up from zero 
from basically here, this one is when it's touching on both there. So we're touching in four places, here, 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 and here. And when we pull this off and flip it around, we're measuring, um, what is that, 22 thousandths, uh, 21, actually 21.6 thousandths uh, is what that measures. And that's almost exactly what I measured before. It was, was 21 and a half thou is what we had measured before. So that tells me my taper per inch. So again, 21.6 thousandths per inch is my taper. And uh, again, that's pretty much exactly what we measured. And that multiplies out to about a quarter of an inch per foot. So uh, anyway, just a cool little tool. Uh, I've used this several times in the past and uh, it's a nice little thing to have around uh, when you're dealing with these tapers to measure. Now again, when we cut it on the lathe, I need to actually set it for half of that angle because when you look at this, it's flared out in both directions. But when we're cutting on the taper attachment, we're really only interested in half of that. So on this one, I would want to set my angle at 1 8 inch per foot. All right, enough talking. Um, let's uh, see about making a taper gauge. I've got a piece of uh, high speed steel here, or it's not high speed steel, this is tool steel, A2 tool steel that we're going to make it out of. I'm going to cut it about six inches long and uh, we'll get started on here in just a minute. Here's my piece of stock we're going to be using again. So uh, this is again some A2 tool steel. Uh, I just, I cut it in half. I didn't want it to be so thick so, so the weight wouldn't see, be so bad. I'm going to put some little uh, rare earth magnets in the bottom to help stick it to hold it onto the side of a shaft to help with the setup process. Um, so I didn't want it to be quite so thick. So I just went over to my um, marvel saw and we just ripped it in half. This is a... Um, um, that tool seal so it will get really really hard but right now it is in the annealed state so that it's uh, machinable and workable and uh, we will we're going to do a heat treatment on this and harden it before we actually grind the uh, angle in on it but uh, right now it's, it's relatively soft and, and that cut pretty easy on the bandsaw what i'm going to do next is go over and uh, I'm just going to get some stamps and we're going to stamp into this the taper. So we'll have that as a reference later on. I won't be having to measure this and trying to figure out what it is. It'll be forever permanently uh, stamped in there just like I did that one. So I'm going to get my number stamps and we'll go over to the welding table and stamp that in there. Here we go. We got that stamped in there. So we will have a reference to that forever and ever after this has been heat treated and hardened that'll be in there we'll always know what that one is and if we ever perchance need this uh gauge again we'll know what it is all right so the next thing i want to do is i want to drill a series of little holes in the bottom of this piece and i'm going to drop in some little rare earth magnets that are a little less than a quarter of an inch in diameter and about 125 thousandths thick so uh, I'm just going to drill some little sockets for those to fit down into. And uh, this will allow me to kind of stick this gauge up onto a piece of metal in the lathe. And it will basically just hold it on the side so that we can run that taper attachment up and down. So let's see. I think we're ready to go here. Put that going in the right direction. I just got a quarter of an inch end mill in here. And... We're just going to raise this up until it starts cutting. Right there, I'm going to zero in my uh, Z axis and we'll go 125,000 feet. Just plunge straight up. And that's about 125 right there. All right, we'll come out. And um, those holes are one inch apart. I'll just uh, use the digital readout here to go exactly an inch and we'll clamp down our table. All right, I think that's got our holes. Take our part out. Here we go. Nice little sockets there for the magnets. We'll just epoxy those in place uh, once we get through with our heat treat. 
All right, we are ready, I think, to go ahead and do our heat treat. We've got our stuff stamped in here, got our holes in the bottom. This is just a rough across the top, but I'm going to grind that in. I'm not even going to worry about trying to mill it. Uh, before we put it in the heat treat oven, though, I want to wrap it up in some of this uh, heat treat foil. And um, this is uh, kind of, a, I think it's a stainless steel. Yeah, it's a stainless steel foil. And what it does is it just protects that metal from coming in contact with air and it just kind of keeps it from corroding as bad so we're going to wrap this thing up real nice and tight in here um, typically when you do this what you'll do is just kind of fold it over a couple of times on itself and you're trying to make a more or less an airtight pocket you know what i forgot usually you want to put a little strip of paper in there that will just uh it'll burn out and any air that's in there it'll it'll consume it so let me get a little sliver of paper and put up in there all right that's just a piece of paper and i can still slide that up in there fold these ends up They make a argon kit for these ovens and I need to get one installed on mine. You can actually flush the inside of your uh, oven with argon from your uh, TIG welder. While you're doing it, you're just putting an inert gas in there and it, it basically accomplishes the same thing. But that'll help keep the oxygen from oxidating um, inside there and keep the scale down on there. So we're ready to go put this in the heat treat oven now. So this is my brand new Hot Shot 360 uh, heat treat oven. Uh, I had one of the original Hot Shots that was uh, designed by Stan Zinkowski, uh, but the good folks over at American Rotary who are now making this, American Kiln, I think is actually the new company, same, same as American Rotary phase converters, but um, they sent me one of these new ovens that has a lot of new features in it. This is to be the first time I've actually used it, uh, but it basically works the same way as the old one. Now, this has got one of these uh, Novus controllers in it over here, and it's the same controller that was in the old ovens, and the nice thing is, is that you can connect this up to your computer and save programs uh, for doing different heat treat recipes and I had already written a program for doing A2 tool steel uh, so basically I just plugged my computer up to this with a USB port and I've already done it but I've written that program over to the controller so I don't have to worry about doing anything in there and it's fairly easy to go into this software and write new programs you just put in the the temperature you want to go to the ramp time how long you want to take it from ramp from one temperature to another and you just put your curves in and uh, let it go so anyway we are going to go ahead and put our piece into the oven I will um, close the oven up and I'm going to turn my control power on. We'll take our USB port out there. And I'm going to do, I want to run the program, say yes, hit it again. And I'm going to enable my heat. And we should be running. Well, just coming out here and checking this thing out. And, uh, we're obviously up to the 800 degree part of the program. It's going to hold it there. I can't remember what it was around um, 45 minutes or an hour, and then it'll ramp it up again. Uh, there's there's several ramp ups uh, in this program uh, to kind of let it soak at different temperatures. So uh, we're just going to let it run its course. Uh, this whole thing will take about three and a half hours to do, and. I'll check on it from time to time, but so far so good. I'm just checking on this oven periodically. I'm actually up in the house working on some stuff, but um, we up to 1200 degrees and we're holding there for a period of time. I know it's got to jump up. I think the 1800 degrees was the last ramp up uh, where it will hold for about an hour. So um, the program is running. Everything's going good and uh, we're getting this heat treat done. So we're up at the 1800 degree ramp. So this would be the last uh, stage. It'll hold it here 
I don't remember what the recipe was, probably about an hour. Uh, but whenever it's done, it'll cool down, or actually we'll pull it out of the oven and, and do the uh, air cooling on it, just let it cool down in the air. And then after that, do the temper. But uh, one thing that's impressive is, I mean, this thing has been running for a couple of hours now. It's up to 1,800 degrees. And, you know, I mean, I can feel a little bit of warmth in there, but I mean, this thing is not hot. It is, I mean, it is not anywhere close to being hot. This is cool on the, on the door. Um, that is a major, major improvement over the old style. Uh, there's basically an air gap around the uh, inner furnace and this outer skin, and there's a fan that pulls air through the back. And uh, I mean, this thing is just as cool as a cucumber. So anyway, that's nice. All right, we'll let this thing run a little bit longer. And uh, when it's done, we'll do the next step. We'll be back. All right, I was over here getting ready for this thing and I looked over and it was ramping down. So I'm only down a couple hundred degrees temperature inside. We should be just fine. It's only been ramping down a minute or two. And I think we're ready to pull her on out. So I'm gonna turn my heat off Whenever I open the door, it should pull it off anyway. But we're gonna go ahead and grab that pouch and I'm gonna set it over here and let it start cooling down. And while that's cooling down, I notice I just put it over here in a little wire tray and I'm gonna turn a fan on here. It's just gonna blow uh, cool air across that and we're gonna let it cool down until it's uh, just warm enough that you can touch it with your hands. And while it's doing that, my oven is ramping down to 400 degrees. And uh, I'm gonna leave the door open, let the oven cool down, and we'll put that back in the oven at 400 degrees and let it soak for about two hours. And uh, after that, our heat treatment will be done. So we'll be back here in just a few minutes. All right, guys, we have cooled the oven down to 400 degrees. Our uh, part is still warm to the touch, but it has cooled down enough. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and put it back in the oven here and we will enable our heat. Um, it's probably gonna ramp up a little bit just because I just closed it back up a little bit, but it's gonna stick around that 400 degrees. And I've got this thing programmed to hold it at 400 degrees for about two hours and uh, then it's going to just shut off and it's just gonna cool off naturally. And this last step is the final step in the heat treat. This is actual tempering it back down. Right now, it's super hard. This is gonna make it a little bit tougher, uh, but we're just gonna go off and leave this, come back in the morning and our part should be heat treated and uh, ready to go. So that's, that's it for until tomorrow. It'll be ready to grind tomorrow. All right, guys, we let this thing uh, cool down overnight. You can see we're at 63 degrees inside the oven and uh, it's completely cooled down. I don't guess I need the pliers. We'll just reach in there and pull it out, but there we go. Let's go open that up, see what she looks like. But uh, the heat treat oven, first time using this uh, new one from American Kiln and uh, did a good job. All right. Let's look at our part. See if we can unwrap this. Have to be careful. This uh, stainless steel foil can be kind of sharp. our part all tucked away inside of there and it looks great uh, you can see we don't really have any oxidation on there there's the ash from that little paper strip that I put in there uh, looks good so all right I think that this is uh ready to go grind before I do that I think I'm gonna go ahead and put these uh, magnets in the bottom and uh, I'm going to use some, probably some epoxy to put those in there and set them in place. Uh, so let's, uh, let me get that going. 
So this is just some uh, JB weld is all this is. It's two part epoxy basically. We'll uh, mix that up and uh, I use that to kind of epoxy those magnets into the bottom of that. We'll just put a little, little dab down each one of these holes. And I'm trying to keep it off of the uh, outside. I'm not doing a good job of that. And these are just little rare earth magnets and I want to make sure I put them all in there the same way. So we're going to put the magnet side down. There we go. There's one. All right. Let me get rag and clean that up. After that epoxy sets, I want to try to get as much of that epoxy off as I can. And all of those magnets are just a little beneath the, uh, the surface of the top, or should be anyway. All right, we're going to give that uh, JB well a little time to set up before we go grind it. So I'm just going to put that aside and we'll be back in a little bit. Let me clean this uh, mess up over here. So there are my magnets in the bottom. They've been epoxied in place. I've let that set up for a couple hours. And uh, what we're going to do is come over to the surface grinder and we're going to let that stick down. I'll turn my mag chuck on too. Yeah, it's a little loose, but it'll be fine. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, you know, this bottom side was the original ground surface on this before the heat treat. So it's not perfect. I did go over and put it on a stone and just kind of, uh, polish it a little bit and I can tell it's, it's, it's low on the ends, a little bit high in the middle. But I'm going to start by just putting that side down and I'm going to hit the top of this uh, side which is a bandsaw cut and all I'm looking to do is just kind of get it where I've got points of contact from one end to the other. Now this may be tapered a little bit, I may have to grind it all the way, uh, but I'm not really looking at getting it cleaned up. This side will be ground to the taper eventually, but I, I want to get a side that I can stick on here and clean up and, and get a good grind on that bottom first because that will be the reference surface. So uh, we've got a uh, wheel in here for hardened steel and uh, anyway let's get started grinding. Alright, I got my table stroke set here. I've actually got my in and out on my headset. Uh, I'm just got it kind of got it set right here. Right now, what I want to do is bring this down until it just starts uh, barely touches on there. Alright, we're touching there. I'm gonna come back up just a little bit. And uh, let's see. And we get my head moving in and out now. And we will uh, come down a little bit so it starts touching off. starting to touch off right there and I am going to now put my head where it automatically uh, drops down a little bit each pass. Get a little coolant going here and let that grind across. All right, we're starting to hit on there a little bit. This is set where every time that um, cutter goes across there, it's automatically down feeding, oh, about a half a thou. So it'll just kind of automatically get to where we want to go. And it's cleaning up pretty uniform across. Not, not as bad as I thought it would be being a uh, 
just a bandsaw cut. And we'll let that kind of get good contact from one end to the other. I may just go ahead and just let it clean all the way up and then we'll grind the bottom. All right, that's cleaned up good enough. I'm gonna turn my down feed off and we're just gonna let this just kind of spark out a little bit. All right, I think that's good. So, um, let's see, we'll get the uh, head in the back position back there. Stop it. Go ahead and stop our table. Turn our coolant off. And now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to flip this over and uh, lightly grind the bottom side, which will be the reference side. This is the side with the magnets on it. not going to take much at all to uh, get this side ground out because it was pretty much already parallel to the other side. Turn my coolant back on. All right, we're going to let that spark out now. This bottom's gonna be my reference surface, so I'm gonna really let this spark out for a little while and just make sure we got a really good grind on it. Uh, the other side will be reground to the taper. Now, I'm gonna pull it off, and I wanna grind these sides. start with the side that's been stamped and the reason I'm starting with that side is because I know that that side's kind of got some raised up areas where we stamped it where the other side's the original uh, grind so and I think we got it right there let's uh, get our table going here this over again. And we should be ready to go again. down feed I think we'll get it I'm gonna turn my down feed off and we'll spark it out again turn everything off and we'll get set up to do the taper next so I've got my uh, magnetic sign plate over here on here. This is for doing an angle. And the way we're gonna do this is, is we can calculate 
how large of a stack of gauge blocks I need to put in here to raise this end up to get that taper that I want, or an angle. If you're doing angles, we're doing tapers in this case. So I know that my taper we're going at is a 3 seconds inch per foot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go over here to my calculator, see if y'all can get that in there. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We, we're looking for a 3 seconds inch per foot taper. So first thing I'm gonna do is get my decimal equivalent for 3 seconds of an inch. So we'll do three divided by 32, that's it. And we're looking at per foot. Now my sign plate, my, my roll pins, my between here and here is 10 inches. Uh, so if, if this was 12 inches, we would just put a 93.7 thousand stack in there and everything would be good. But because we're doing it on 10 inches, what I need to do is I need to divide that by 12 which is how many inches are in a foot. And that's how, that's the stack per inch, or per, yeah, per one inch. And now I need to multiply that times 10 because that's the diff distance between my rolls. And we come out to 78.1 thousandths is how big of a stack, how much higher this end needs to be on this end to give us that taper. Now, because of the way mine is, there's a little uh, drop down here, that's 100,000, so I need a 178,000 uh, stack in there, so one of my pins is uh, 128,000, when I'm 50,000, that comes out to 78,000. So what I can do now is we will just drop our whole thing down onto that stack, and now the taper, on this uh, sign plate is going to be 3 seconds of an inch per foot. If I wanted to figure out the angle, we could go about a little bit different math to do that, but we're doing uh, tapers in inches per foot here, and uh, so that's what we're going to do. So I've got my, my uh, gauge up on the top now. This is mag down, and we're just going to go in here and grind this until it cleans up from one end to the other. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some marks on here, that way I can kind of see where we're going. What will happen is, is it's gonna start hitting up here first and we'll drop it down until it's ground all the way down to the very end. And I think what I'll do is I'll really color this bottom end out good so I can really see it when we get all the way down there. All right, back to grinding. All right, we are working on grinding that taper in. Uh, I've been going we're about halfway across the the width of it now and basically again it's, it's cutting more off of the front end than it is off the back end so each pass it kind of moves down a little bit farther on the grind uh, and we're just going to have to continue on until we get all the way to the very end uh, and it's just going to take a little bit of time we're just going to take our time and let it work its way across and uh, but once we get through with this so let it spark out and we should have our taper gauge all finished up. So here we go guys, here's our finished taper gauge and I'm real happy with how it turned out. So um, everything looks good on it and to confirm that we've got the right taper, we're gonna again use a, a taper micrometer. This is a smaller one, does the exact same thing as the one we did before and we're gonna measure that taper and make sure that it is correct. So let's do that real quick. Uh, this is a small end on this end, so I'm going to push that in until it gets tight in the bottom. And I, I made sure that I adjust it where I'm not on top of one of those magnets. And now we will come in here and measure the difference between the height of this side and this side. This is one inch. And according to my math, it should be 7.8 thousandths. And we are... Let's see here. All right, so we're at seven. And I got a tense gauge on here. And it looks like we're about seven tenths. So, okay, I missed it by one ten thousandth of an inch. I think we can live with that. It's probably within the range of error of all my measurements going on here. But I'm confident that we've got a taper gauge that is the correct taper to match the taper on that hub. 
and we will use this in the next video to set up our taper gauge on the lathe, our taper attachment on the lathe to turn the proper taper. So there you go, making a taper gauge. Well, there we go. Always fun in the shop, something to do. You know, this isn't necessarily directly related to or directly going to be going on the Jimmy Dress the Bandsaw project, but to get the job done, we actually had to make a tool to be able to do a measurement properly. So it's part of the job. And, uh, you know, now we've got this. If for some strange reason I ever need this taper again, I will have a taper gauge over in my toolbox ready to pull out and use. Um, it's always nice to have these references. I've got several tapers in there, but of course, never have the one you need, but no big deal. It's one of the great things about having a machine shop. When you need something special like this, you can just make it yourself. So there you go, guys. That is going to be his wrap. As always, thanks for watching. Please do subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thumbs up and comments are appreciated. It really helps out with the algorithms over at YouTube. So I appreciate you guys doing that. And I hit that bell icon up there to, to get notifications when new videos are posted. And with that, guys, we'll catch you on the next video. Again, thanks for watching.